Hey guys, it's Cosmic Skeptic, and I think it's no secret that of all the writers I most admire and enjoy, Christopher Hitchens is perhaps the crowning jewel. Christians are advised to love their enemies, and this was never more strongly acted out than in their interactions with the Hitch, who it really was impossible not to love. Except maybe in the case of George Galloway. You're now a slug. You did write like an angel. But you're now working for the devil, and damn you, and all your works. I adore Christopher Hitchens, his humour, his charm, and his frankly enviable prose. I also believe he got a good many things right across his various writings, not discluding, by the way, a prescient awareness of animal rights in both his foreword to Orwell's Animal Farm and his chapter on the pig in God is Not Great. Still, to avoid the perhaps not entirely unreasonable charge of sycophancy, I've taken it upon myself to identify what I believe to be some of Hitchens' weakest arguments in his religious debates. So weak, in fact, that I really think they should be considered discrediting and serve as a reminder that, fierce and brilliant as Hitchens was as a journalist, he was in no way a serious philosopher. Undoubtedly, I am supremely influenced by Hitchens in both my thoughts and the way that I express them. I might well have watched every single video clip of him that exists on the internet, and I can quote him from memory. His influence, in other words, has undeniably made me what I am today. But if Christopher Hitchens can turn on his maker, and so can I, and that's exactly what I'm intending to do in today's video. In Letters to a Young Contrarian, Hitchens writes, I attack and criticise people myself. I have no right to expect lenience in return. And so lenience there shall not be. I want to expose some of Hitchens' worst argumentative characteristics and show how he employs them to make you think that he has the upper hand in a debate, even when he definitely doesn't. The biggest problem with Hitchens' bad arguments was that he presented them so charmingly and convincingly that it's easy to be won over by them. Unfortunately, presenting bad arguments cleverly is the definition of sophistry and so definitely worth calling out and breaking down. In fact, I think the only way to trust a person's admiration for someone is in the knowledge that they recognise their faults, if and where they exist. I'm not claiming that Hitchens was always sophistic, of course, and neither am I claiming that when he was, he was so intentionally. But I fear the prospect of idolisation and also of getting into the habit of only criticising my opponents. So this should be a good exercise in humility and self-reflection. Now, I won't be touching on Hitchens' support for the invasion of Iraq, or the infamous essay on the female sense of humour. The problem with female comedians up till now is they tend to be either uh, dykes or Jews or butch. Firstly, because I want to focus on his religious debates, as this is more my area, but also because asking you on Twitter what you thought were his worst arguments, these were the ones that came up the most. I'm more interested in those things that people don't already popularly agree that he got wrong, I want to talk about those things which people generally think he was right about, or that slipped under the radar, that I have a quarrel with. And there are three examples in particular of areas which I think demonstrate just terrible arguments and responses from Hitchens. These are his views on morality, free will, and the cosmological argument. This list isn't exhaustive, of course, but I think these examples are typical of him, and so will give you an idea of the kind of problem I have with Hitchens' style of arguing. The main thing to notice is that Hitchens continually manages to weasel his way out of actually answering serious questions by relying on quips, jokes, or other kinds of distractions. So we'll take these three points in turn and demonstrate why Hitchens just utterly failed when addressing them. I should add, in my opinion. Guess what? Guess who's saying it? That's a very clever thing to say. Shall I ask, would you prefer I uttered your opinion? What a fatuous <laughs> remark. Chris For our first example, Hitchens seems to misunderstand the moral argument for the existence of God. This is the argument that states that since there can be no objective morality without God, and yet objective morality exists, there must be a God. Right? The main questions at hand are these. Does objective morality in fact exist? And if it does, how does the atheist ground it without God? Is that possible? Well, let's see what Hitchens has to say. If Christopher Hitchens does not believe in God, reviewers have asked, then where does he get his sense of right and wrong? You have replied, in print, that this question is in itself insulting, and you have rejected, quote, the appalling insinuation that I would not know right from wrong if I was not supernaturally guided, close quote. Why do you find it insulting? Because I think it's degrading to 
to the human, to us, to you and me, to imply, well, not to imply, to state directly that uh, absent a celestial dictatorship that had some supernatural influence over us, yet to be established, by the way, as, as anything really existent, but without the assumption of it, we wouldn't know right from wrong. Degrading it may be, Hitch, but you're not answering the question. Okay, the question was asked, how do you determine right and wrong without God? And Hitchens responds that this is insulting because it suggests that we potentially can't determine right and wrong without God. Well, yes, that's the question. He hasn't actually made a point, he's just restated the question and said that it's insulting. Well, tough luck if it's insulting. That doesn't constitute an answer. His point is, of course, that the question is a silly one. But he needs to provide a justification for why it's silly, not just say that it is, relying on his audience's tendency to go, yeah, I don't need God, to get us riled up at the very question. Uh, we wouldn't return stolen property if we found it in the back of a cab. We wouldn't give blood if someone badly needed a transfusion, unless we were afraid either of reward, either of punishment or desirous of a reward, uh, that we might help ourselves to underage uh, children, as some religious people have actually been uh, known to do. Um, because after all, what's stopping us? Now, you could tell me if you wanted that you would do all those things if you weren't God-fearing, but I would choose not to believe you. I have more respect for you, if not for your opinions, than that. This is the next thing that Hitchens would regularly do on this point. He conflates two different questions. By saying, of course you would still be moral if you didn't believe in God, he's responding to the idea that atheists can't be moral. But that wasn't the question. The question was not how can atheists be moral, but how can atheists ground their morality? This is a subtle difference, but it's crucial. Hitchens has got a lot of praise for making this kind of argument. Of course I'm still moral despite not believing in the supernatural dictator. I'm insulted that you would suggest that I can't act ethically without divine permission. I don't believe in the rest of it, don't believe in the prophets, don't believe in the mountaintop, don't believe in the revelation. Well, nor should you. But how dare you suggest to us that we couldn't teach our children self-restraint and respect for others and the golden rule? How dare you! But when the religious say that there cannot be such thing as morality without God, they're not saying that there cannot be such thing as morality without belief in God. They say that you can be an atheist and be moral, you just can't objectively ground your morality. So when Hitchens asks, how dare you say that I can't be moral without believing in God, he's answering an objection that was never put to him. He's answering a different question one that the religious rarely, if ever, actually ask. But when the question is framed more clearly, sometimes Hitchens understands that he is in fact being asked to ground morality, not just to prove that he's a moral person. Let's have a look at what he has to say when this occurs. At every time I'm asked this question, if you didn't believe in God, how would you know what was good and what wasn't? Every time I'm asked to speak on this, the daily news allows me to give a different answer, and give a different example. Um, Take the simplest case of what I believe is innate, our instinct for our children. You don't have to be a parent to have this. Uh, you see a, ch a child trying to rush into the traffic. If you're not a parent, something tells you what you probably ought to be doing about it. Um, the care and love and protection of children is instinct in us, in, that, in fact, in many other species too that don't claim to be divinely ordered around. Um, <laughs> It's something we all share without having to have it explained to us. So Hitchens is answering the following question. How do we ground our sense of morality? And his answer? Well, we all have a sense of morality within us. The question is, how do you know that it's right to care about children? His answer? Well, any parent instinctively cares about children. We're not interested in whether we have a moral instinct. Of course we do. Who doesn't know this? What we're interested in is how to justify the moral instinct, which Hitchens fails to do by simply appealing to the fact that the instinct exists. A further elaboration on this comes from Hitchens' debate with Frank Churek, in which the same question is raised. If God does not exist, why do all people have a fixed moral obligation to love and not murder? How do molecules in motion have any authority to tell you how to behave? When you do something wrong, whose standard are you breaking? Who are you displeasing? The carbon atom? The benzene, benzene molecule? Who? This question has been asked, uh, the, Socrates answered it like this, when he was on trial for his life. Uh, accused of blasphemy, by the way. Um, he said that he had an inner daemon, was the way he put it. Not demon, a daemon, a spirit, uh, an inner critic, a conscience would be one way of putting it. And that he, he knew enough to know, even when he was making the best speech of his life, 
that if he was making a point that was somehow dishonest or uh, incomplete or shady, the daemon would tell him, yeah, that was clever, but you shouldn't have tried it. He knew. Okay. Any, any person of average moral equipment has the same knowledge. I hope you'll... If you don't, I'm very sorry for you. Um, Adam Smith called it the, the internal witness, who we all have to have a conversation with all the time. Um, it's been C.S. Lewis decided to call it conscience and to attribute it to the, to the divine, but he didn't improve on what Adam Smith said in the Theory of Moral Sentiments or what Socrates said when, on, when standing trial for his, own, for his own life. Again, Hitchens is asked, of those moral instincts that he has, how does he know that they are objectively correct? His answer? Well, Socrates answered this well by saying that we have a moral instinct within us. That's not the question. The question is how do we justify the instinct? Hitchens is totally avoiding the question. And if you think I'm being unfair here, take a listen to what he says next. Still talking about the moral instinct within him, he says this. It's been sometimes colloquially defined as why do people behave well when nobody's looking? I don't believe there's anyone in this hall who doesn't know what I mean by that. The instinct is sometimes defined as why do people do good things when nobody is looking? Hitchens is, in other words here, conceding the very point in question, that the moral instinct he has identified within us leaves wide open the question of why it exists and how we can justify it. Also, note how, when talking about this intuition, Hitchens says, any one of average moral equipment has the same knowledge. Any, any person of average moral equipment has the same knowledge. I, I hope you'll... If you don't, I'm very sorry for you. This implicitly recognises that some people don't share his moral intuition. Some people don't have the same moral equipment. The question we are asking is, how can we know whose moral intuitions are correct? Hitchens responds by saying that you'll have the correct moral instinct if you have the proper moral equipment. Well, how do we know who has the proper moral equipment? Of course, because they have the correct moral instinct. This is the definition of circularity. There are people to whom that, those thoughts do not occur, who are deaf to that idea, who only think of themselves, who wouldn't worry about the internal daemon or censor or, uh, or companion. And there are, of course, people who only get pleasure from being um, unpleasant to other people and inflicting cruelty on them. Aha, we may be getting somewhere. Hitchens is here recognising that some people just don't share his moral intuition. How can we know that they have it wrong and we have it right? Well, let's see. The first group we call the sociopathic and the second group we call the psychopathic. My only and They occur in nature and in society. My only problem is with those who think that they're all made in the image of God. The one explanation that absolutely doesn't work at all. So Hitchens answers the problem of some people not sharing his moral intuitions by simply stating that we call them psychopaths and sociopaths. Okay, but the question is why we're justified in saying that they have it wrong, which you can't answer by simply calling them psychopaths. Notice that Hitchens then immediately moved to criticising religious morality. This constitutes an argumentative fallacy that Hitchens would always commit the tu quoque fallacy. Tu quoque means you as well, and is a fallacy committed when a person is presented with a mistake in their argument and responds by saying that their opponent makes the same mistake. It may be hypocritical of somebody to criticise the mistake of another person while committing the mistake themselves, but this doesn't change the fact that a mistake has been made. When, in later life, Hitchens advised people not to smoke for the benefit of their health, someone could have responded, but you smoke. This is of course true, but it doesn't make Hitchens' advice any less good just because he doesn't follow it himself. In our present discussion, Hitchens has been challenged with the claim that an atheist can't ground morality. He first brushes over the question, as we've seen, and then he says, but my problem is that the religious can't do it either. Okay, let's say they can't. That doesn't change the fact that you haven't done so either. If someone asks, how do you justify morality, and your response is, well, you can't do it either, you're committing a fallacy. Now you might say in response to this that Hitchens doesn't have a burden of proof here. He doesn't have to prove that morality exists. That's on the religious. But Hitchens quite clearly believes and claims that morality does exist. And so long as he is making that claim, he does have a burden of proof, which he simply isn't meeting. But aside from that brief intermission, here's a summary of Hitchens and the moral argument in its plainest fashion. But if there is no God, if there is no objective ground of right and wrong from what 
do you derive your morals? Hitchens first argues that morality is innate within us. First, I think our, right. our knowledge of the right and wrong is innate in us. But then the interview oppresses him. We have many such innate intuitions, some of which are false. So how can we know that the moral intuition we have within us, as you say, is actually correct? The problem is that there are all kinds of things that we're stuck with as a result of evolution, if one posits evolution. So you feel biological urges, you feel, you feel the impulse to steal, and you, yet it's at the same time you have some kind of in, innate morality that tells you not to steal. So the question is, with a religious point of view, it gives you some way, you say there's an objective standard according to which we can, uh, we, we, suggest, we recognize that certain, um, certain of these impulses are acceptable and certain other impulses are to be disciplined and restrained and so forth. I don't understand how if you take it all as, as a kind of evolutionary f result, result of evolution, let's put it that way, how it is that you can say morality is over and above other urges. How do you do that? Can you guess how Hitchens answers? Um, not to be grand about it, but that, well, Socrates, is what Socrates called his daemon. It was a, an inner voice that stopped him when he was trying to take advantage of someone in an argument. Wrongly. He simply asserts that we have a moral intuition. I'll remind you of the question. We have many intuitions. How do we know which ones are actually correct? His answer? Because we have a moral intuition. It just amazes me that this passes for a serious argument. I've chosen the topic of free will as the next example because it demonstrates another tendency of Hitchens to improperly answer a question in order to gain a cheap laugh from an audience. Now, this is something he actually admits to doing. So if I'm making a speech, right. and I make a cheap point to get a laugh, which I'm not above doing, I can do that, or, or I skip a stage in an argument you know, to make a, an inexpensive point, and especially if it works, and I get the laugh, I, I feel a pang. So let's see this in action. Are you assuming that we one, have free will? One, 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 are, you, are you assuming that we have free will? If you answer, if you ask, if you answer, then give me you, another. My give me another a, source. If you answer my question with another. Give question, me another. I'll still source. answer it. Okay. I will still answer it, Thank even you. though your question is an answer to mine, rather not an answer, a response to mine. Yeah. Um, the view I take about free will is that, of course, we have free will because we have no choice but to have it. And the first thing to note is that Hitchens doesn't seem best pleased when his question is answered with another question. Bear that in mind for later when we discuss the cosmological argument. Now, the second thing is noted by his opponent, David Woolpe himself. So, so I was, in some extent, not an I was in a... That is indeed a quip rather than a proper answer. You'll understand if you've seen my previous extensive videos and conversations about the intricacies of free will, how frustrating it is to see the topic treated so flippantly. But let's give Hitchens a chance here. I was, and I still, to some extent, am a dialectical materialist, and I also think there are some, there are some ironies in the anyway. universe's worst in history. But to say, of course we have free will, the boss says we've got it, is to make a mockery of the whole concept. OK, so Hitchens was asked whether or not we have free will, with the implicit expectation to justify his answer. His response? Well, to say that free will comes from God makes a mockery of the concept. We've already talked about this. Can you see what he's done? It's the two-quarque fallacy again. Well, you can't justify free will. OK, but that doesn't change the fact that you have also failed to do so, Mr Hitchens. This is the takeaway from the numerous times Hitchens does this kind of thing, turning the question onto his religious opponent. He manages to wriggle his way out of actually answering any seriously difficult philosophical questions himself. And because they are difficult questions, when he turns them on the religious, they struggle to answer them, gaining him brownie points in a debate. And I'll stress this point about the burden of proof. You may still think that Hitchens shouldn't have to answer the question because the burden of proof is not on him, but on his religious opponent. Well, first, if this is true, Hitchens should just say so instead of pretending as though he can answer the question by providing some quip or irrelevant observation. But I don't even think this is the case. Hitchens clearly says that he does believe in free will. Hitchens says that he does actively believe that morality exists. Separate from the God claim, on which he doesn't have the burden of proof, these are independent claims he is making that do require justification. He does have the burden of proof, so long as he's making them. But whatever, okay, accepting that we won't actually get a serious answer from Hitchens about whether and how free will exists on an atheistic worldview, let's at least examine his critique of religious free will. Here it is again. But to say, of course we have free will, the boss says we've got it, 
is to make a mockery of the whole concept. The force of this objection is all to do with the way Hitchens phrases things. Imagine, if you will, that I am the employee of a company, and my boss gives me an hour of free time for lunch. Someone like Hitchens might say, to say that I have a free hour because the boss demands it makes a mockery of the concept. But of course, it doesn't. The boss doesn't demand that I'm free for his sake, he permits my freedom for my sake. Now, to be clear, I don't think that free will exists, and I don't think that God can permit free will, and arguably if he does, he does so ultimately for his own sake and not for ours. These are all things I believe and good arguments and interesting lines of thought. They're just not things that Hitchens ever said, instead deciding to get a cheap laugh from the audience at the expense of actually answering the question. A bit like he does in this famous example, too. That could be an unpleasant thing, but how do you develop... Actually an evil thing, let's, you say. Let's call it evil, only, Christopher. That's only a religious person would dream of saying. Let's call it evil. Where does evil come from? Religion. <laughs> but Hitchens didn't always avoid answering the question by making a joke. Sometimes he avoided answering a question by simply inventing another question and answering that instead. Okay, for a clear example of this, I turn back to Hitchens' debate with Frank Turek and present his response to the question, how can something come from nothing? So if there was nothing, how do you get something from nothing without a cause? How do you get, I can answer the same question in the way I did before, how do you get so much nothing from something? You look into the night sky, if you're in, say, the Carmel Peninsula, you can't do it from many parts of Virginia now, but if you are in certain parts of California, as I was recently, you can look on, into the night sky and see universes blowing up and bursting into flame every night of the week, several times. Uh, they had something and it's all nothing now. How, who's the author of that? Who mandated that? Who's the creator of that? Who's the dictator who demands that sacrifice? The fact that things You're making a rod for your own back here. Yikes. It is difficult to know where to begin with this one. First, the question is a metaphysical one. How is it possible that from a state of non-existence, existence can come? Consider Hitchens' point that many stars and galaxies have exploded into nothing. Well, this isn't quite true if we're being technical. The matter that made up the stars is still there, it's just exploded across the universe. But the matter itself, the stuff, still exists. So it's not the case that truly nothing has come from something, as Hitchens suggests. This makes it an inappropriate analogy to something coming from nothing, by which Frank Turek meant literally nothing. As in, not atoms in space, or quantum fluctuations, or Lawrence Krauss's nothing, but nothing. Hitchens asks, what about the things that do exist and then don't exist anymore? Well, the stuff itself that makes up those things does still exist. It's just been rearranged. When Turek asks how something comes from nothing, he doesn't mean how do atoms form themselves into stars or something like that, which would be the actual reverse of Hitchens' questions. He means how did the atoms get there in the first place? So the questions are not actually about the same thing. But anyway, Hitchens has answered Frank's question with a question. Something he apparently doesn't like when other people do to him. How do you get something from nothing without a cause? How do you get, I can answer the same question in the way I did before, how do you get so much nothing from something? If you answer, if you ask, if you answer, then give me another, give me another source. If you answer my question with another give question, me another I'll still source. answer it. Okay. I will still answer it, Thank even you. though your question is an answer to mine. Rather, not an answer, a response to mine. But notice anyway how this is nothing more than a distraction. Hitchens is asked a metaphysical question. How does something come from nothing? His response? Why is it that stars explode and the universe will end? It's totally irrelevant. Just pointing to the fact that things come to an end does not explain how they were created in the first place. That just doesn't answer the question. The question is, how did things come about? And Hitchens responds by saying, ah, well, have you considered that they'll come to an end? He doesn't even attempt to answer the question. To make a comparison, this would be like if Frank had presented the teleological argument, asking why there are complex things in the universe and saying that these indicate a designer. And instead of actually answering the question, say by pointing to natural selection, Hitchens were to respond with something like, ah, but we also see many simple things in the universe. How do you explain that? It's like, that's another question. It may be a useful question, but it's a different question and it's got nothing to do with the question that you were actually asked, 
which you evidently don't have an answer to. Now, at this point, if you've followed the trend of the other arguments, you may be expecting me to say that this is a two quark way fallacy again. Except it isn't. It's actually much worse than that. It would be a two quark way fallacy if Turek had said, Hitchens can't explain how something comes from nothing, and Hitchens said, yeah, well, you can't explain it either. That would be an example of the fallacy. Instead, Hitchens responds by saying, yeah, well, you can't explain this other unrelated thing. It's a totally unrelated observation. Imagine you were arguing with someone, let's call him Histopher Critchens, who believed that the Egyptians did not build the pyramids and instead believed that they were just natural objects. You ask them, how on earth do you get the pyramids from nothing but sand in a desert? And Critchens responds, well, they probably won't last forever, you know. Erosion will destroy them eventually. So if these Egyptians really did design them, they did a pretty poor job, don't you think? It's like, that's not an answer to the question. It's totally unrelated. Not only this, but the question Hitchens asks in response to Frank's question is not even a good one. You may be thinking, even if Hitchens failed to answer the question of how something comes from nothing, we can at least say that he had a counterpoint, a separate point, but a good point, in saying that the universe seems headed for destruction and this doesn't square with a loving God. Okay, if God was a competent designer, why would he design our world in such a way that it will one day be destroyed? Now, as I address this point, I want to stress that even if Hitchens was right in this point, it's still completely separate to the question he was actually asked and got away with not having to answer. So in this example, Hitchens is debating with Frank Turek, a Christian. Now, of course, Christians believe in judgment day and the second coming of Christ. In other words, they believe that God will intervene and send human beings to the afterlife before the sun explodes, before the galaxy collapses, before the universe ends. The fact that our world is headed towards destruction doesn't matter because judgment day will occur and it will occur before it has the chance to end. That's the Christian belief. This is a fairly simple observation, probably one that you've thought of yourself. And in fact, Frank Turek says exactly this to Hitchens. And look what happens. And of course, religious people believe that somebody's going to intervene to stop it before it does go. And even if- Oh, they do? Even if it doesn't- Wait, 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 even wait. If no, hold on. Sorry. Even if nobody intervenes- Do, did, if do the religious among death, you- If it goes to heat death. Excuse me. Did the religious among you, ladies and gentlemen, understand, I did not, that there will be an intervention to make an exception in our case? I mean, does Hitchens not understand the idea that the religious believe in an afterlife that will save us from earthly destruction? I mean, seriously? That's the Christian view, and as, as I, I said- I had no idea. Yes. <laughs> that I had no idea. Heaven and new earth will be created. Genesis is paradise lost. Revelation is paradise I restored. Have it, have it your way. Have it, it sounds fatuous to me, I've got to say. Have it your way, it sounds fatuous to me. I mean, is this Hitchens conceding that this is, in fact, the Christian worldview? If so, his previous point completely collapses. And the only point remaining is now that the idea of an intervention sounds fatuous. Okay, so if God creates the universe and allows it to end, that's poor design and should be condemned. But if he intervenes to stop it from ending, that's fatuous. You're not leaving many options open, Mr. Hitchens. Hitchens just argued that the reason the religious view is silly is because the world is eventually going to be allowed to come to destruction. But then when faced with the supposition that the religious view is precisely the opposite of this, that it will not be allowed to come to destruction, he says that's ridiculous. But these are opposites of each other, they're the only two options. Either the universe will end, or it will not. And apparently both are ridiculous to Hitchens. But this is crucial, both the universe ending and not ending are ridiculous according to Hitchens, if they were designed, right? So Hitchens, to show that he has a better explanation that isn't ridiculous, must address the question of how the universe could come into being without a designer. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, this is the very question we started with that Hitchens refused to even try to answer. This whole conversation is a train wreck. Well, then, okay, I think that just about sums things up. Um, obviously, there are many more examples of this kind of argumentation to be found in the Hitchens catalogue, but I feel that these should be enough examples to help you spot it for yourself. Now, I'd like to stress, in closing, that Hitchens is my favourite writer, and I really can't whittle down just how appreciative I am for everything that he has contributed to my academic life. And I know many of you watching feel the same. 
but please don't let the man's aura blind you to his mistakes and faulty reasoning, and please don't think that just because he won the debate, he also won the argument. But anyway, thank you for watching, I hope you found it interesting. I'd like to remind you that everything I do is supported by my viewers on Patreon, and so if you like what I produce, please do consider helping it to continue by becoming a patron of the channel. Um, a special thanks to my top tier patrons, Itamar, Evan, Faraz, and James. Uh, you can also get Cosmic Skeptic merchandise at cosmicclothing.shop and follow me on social media using the links in the description. Do hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already. Stay safe, stay inside, and I'll see you in the next one.